Disclaimer. Even though we are revisiting one of ours, and I assume one of your favorite television shows from childhood, we are doing it as adults. So what you are getting will be of an explicit nature. Hey, John Francois here. Well, as you know, it's a groundbreaking episode that sets the tone for Family Matters from here on out. And me and Andrew have a lot to say. So let's continue with our conversation. Part two of our season one, episode 12 recap. It's Laura's first date. Harriet tells Judy to finish her Brussels sprouts, and Judy says that Brussels sprouts make her want to puke. And then we see the family react disturbingly because, of course, they're that family that doesn't want to hear mention of vomiting as they're trying to eat. It reminds me of my mom back in the day, I think, because I, I'm so casual, as you can tell when I'm talking about, like, poop and farting and whatnot. So <laughs> anytime I would just, like, utter, like, the first syllable, like, <laughs> like my mom would just be like, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. That talk is for the bathroom. Go to the bathroom if you want to talk about that. (laughs) I never had this problem as a kid, but that doesn't like gross me out hearing it. But I can see people getting grossed out. Yes. Because I I guess somehow people just imagine eating poop instead of eating the Brussels sprouts that they are eating. So that's your fault for having that imagery, not my fault. Yeah, I can't. I don't see if I would get that because like the Brussels sprouts are warm, they're steamy. Like it doesn't remind me of poop. So just hearing the word poop or puke, I'm like, whatever, you'll be fine. Harriet, again, being a fantastic stern mother and saying that at her table, Brussels sprouts are eaten and what Judy does on her time is her business. And we're also reminded this was a time. Remember the 90s? Brussels sprouts. Ew. Like it was the most disgusting food that every kid wanted to stay from, stay away from. And then um, I read this I because in my commercial radio job, like I look up stuff for content. And I remember reading this source that said that there's like a specific ingredient change that they did with Brussels sprouts to make them tastier nowadays. So now my wife, Tony, she'll make Brussels sprouts every now and then. And I'm just like, oh, OK, this is fine. It's OK. But like, remember, like that shift from. Brussels sprouts being disgusting to now a thing that's not so bad. I've always loved Brussels sprouts, so I don't know. Um, I can definitely say the taste has changed if you buy like from the big brands compared to like Farm Fresh. But I don't know. I've always loved Brussels sprouts. They were like little cabbages and I would play with them when I would eat them. But have you ever seen like in pop culture, TV shows and movies where kids were forced to eat them and they're like, no. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. That trope a lot, especially like. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Those are some things that were Beethoven, those movies. The kids hated Brussels sprouts, but I love them. I don't get it. And you know what? I think I've had them with ketchup and they're just delightful. (laughs) They are pretty good with ketchup. I like to take them and dip them into ranch. And oh my gosh, that's so good. Okay. All right. That's your choice. I I will. I I always stay away from ranch at all costs. (laughs) And I believe if I'm not mistaken, unfortunately, this is our only, this is our, Last Judy moment. I think Judy was had had that cold open moment. Like she was along with Carl and Laura was seeing Eddie's dress. And then she has this moment with the Brussels sprouts. And then after that, I mean, we don't we don't have any more Judy in this episode. Yeah, this is Judy's last moment in this episode. I'm gonna just like say that she went to like some kids party or something and she had a night out, and that's why we don't see her anymore. But was it a dance or a party? You know what? That's the conundrum there. It was a dance party. <laughs> you know what? And, th- and that is that is fine. How come they can't just say that? It, Laura is going to a dance party. Like, their dance parties have been things that have been named as such. <laughs> yes. Like, I still am very confused because even where it takes place, I'm just like, so is this a school event, a non-school event? Is this formal? Is this not formal? It throws me this whole episode. Rachel walks over to Laura and comfortingly tells her she knows this dance is a big moment in her life. So Rachel thought she'd make her a dress with puffy sleeves and ask Laura what she thinks. And oh boy, I'm just afraid of another version of that ugly pink dress from the cold open. Laura bummingly tells Rachel to save herself the trouble because nobody has asked her to the dance. Rachel says she's sure somebody will. Carl agrees with Rachel and tells Laura there are plenty of boys out there who are trying to get the courage to call her. He points to the wall telephone and insists that it will ring any minutes he's a girl dad in this moment and i love that we get this moment of them saying the phone's gonna ring any minute again this is what the third episode that they've done this in we got that when harriet was waiting to get the call about the job um oh and then we got it one other time oh when they're 
waiting for the phone to ring for Alan. The rest of the family audibly agrees with Carl, and then we get a nice stretch of awkward silence as they all wait for the phone to ring. Eddie eventually breaks the silence by asking if they're going to wait long. Laura rolls her eyes a bit and says nobody is ever going to call, and she goes through this for every dance. She knows when a dance is coming up because the phone will go dead. And I think it was that line that Laura gave me like a slight Southern accented delivery that I think I've heard from her before. Yeah, I think it was like, oh, I know when the dance comes up because the phone will go dead like it just seems like early laura is like oh i'm gonna kind of take sassy harriet but maybe do like a southern thing with it like a southern ghetto thing with it do we, were you picking up that up that as well i did hear that weird southern ish accent and i'm like where is laura from is she a part of this family you know what let's look it up where is kelly shanghai williams from or kelly s williams because i don't know how to pronounce her middle name she's from washington dc so fuck no she's not anywhere from alabama <laughs> I don't know. Maybe she's oh oh. Maybe she was channeling Mama Winslow at the same time. I guess is Rosetta is Rosetta Lenoir from the South. Does she have any Southern background? Let's find out. She is from New York City. Oh darn! <laughs> and why was Harriet not okay with Laura going to this dance all of a sudden if she's been able to go to past dances? Because Laura's like, oh, well, with all the dances I want to go to in the past, the phone has gone dead. So it's like, wait, so suddenly this dance is different? I mean, I guess it's because Laura is getting that age where Harriet is like, oh shit, she's growing up. She's going to like boys. Maybe, because I picked that up too. I was like, wait, so Laura's <laughs> been to other dances. So why is this such a big deal for this one? And then if nobody ever calls around the dance times, that means she had to go to the dances by herself before. So why is she embarrassed to go alone? Lots of questions that are not being answered here. So Laura gets up from the table and awkwardly runs away to wherever. I mean, she has another random... She she has another awkward, dramatic moment like this toward the end of the episode that I want to discuss with you. (laughs) Harriet stands up from the table and tells Carl she told him so because she's just too young for this dating thing. All right, we're going back to confusing dating and just going to a dance slash party. And also, as Laura's teenage years are around the corner, I feel like it's wiser to teach her about the realities of dating. Like, all right, sometimes you're going to get rejected. And... There are times where you may want to make the first move and go with that instinct rather than just like say like, oh, God, he's too young. I don't want him to grow up too fast. So I'm just going to avoid this conversation. I don't know what it was with parents, especially in sitcoms back in. They would not use their words to speak to their children. It's like, just speak to the kids. If you speak to them, they'll understand and maybe not get it fully. But they would have been like, "Okay, this makes more sense than you just telling me this is a bad idea. You should never start dating. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that was my parental upbringing, too, when it came to things like sex and whatnot. It was just something that they never really felt comfortable or eager to talk about. It was just simply like, oh, don't do that. We don't talk about it and don't do it. (laughs) (laughs) If you hold hands, you're going to get pregnant. That's the kind of crap that we would hear. Don't live in sin. Oh, I would hear that all the time. So let's put it on a t-shirt. Everything was living in sin. Pokemon, you're living in sin. Don't watch that. I think we should have a picture of Laura and maybe, yeah, let, let's have a picture of Laura and Mark and then just put like under it, living in sin. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have to put some fire behind them, like hellfire. That'll be perfect. I would love that. Oh, my God, that would be so great. Carl tells Rachel to go ahead and make that dress because Laura is going to get a date and he can guarantee that. And, you know, I, as much as I appreciate uh, Carl's encouraging dadness, but let's not make too much of a gamble here. If she gets a date, great. If she doesn't, things are still okay. Life moves on. Yes, things move on. And having a date is not the end all be all. Music fades us into the next scene. Like I said, I mean, doesn't it feel like the scenes just keep going and going and going? They do. And it's the fade ins and fade outs that just they speed up the pacing of the episode so fast. Scene four, are faded to the living room with Carl seated in the center stage couch making a phone call. And I was like, when? since when did we have this phone on the coffee table? Was it there before? I don't remember a phone being on the coffee table. I do remember a phone being on the, like, in table behind the couch that's like stage right most every scene but i don't remember there being one on the coffee table in the center of the room and uh oh god the moment carl picks up the phone and talks he's already doing that boundary violating thing in the dating department that he did with 
Rachel in the fourth episode. It's revealed that he's on the phone with Steve Urkel's dad. And I'm guessing at this point, Carl only knows Steve in vague, unseen passing as a neighbor around the same age as Laura, rather than like actually physically meeting him. Because, you know, we see how Carl reacts to Steve later on as if he doesn't know him or met him before. Right. Yeah. It seems like he didn't know anything about Steve and he may have just run into Steve's father and like passing or something. But that was it. Carl introduces himself to Mr. Urkel on the phone, tries to get him to remember the time they met at the pet shop. And I felt like that might have been foreshadowing for the next episode, because the next episode, if you remember, the Winslow's taking a dog. Yes, yes, man's best friend. After Mr. Urkel quietly responds on the other end, Carl calls back a joke from an earlier scene with Steve and states that he recalls Mr. Urkel buying mice. Carl then proceeds to become sort of a pimp for his daughter and asks Mr. Urkel for a favor. Carl asks him if his son Steve happens to have a date for the party tomorrow night. We then hear someone in the audience appropriately groan after Carl asked that question because well, we always have that smart member of the audience that, mm, God, something bad is about to happen here. Yes, yes. I, that audible groan was so noticeable. I feel like they left it in on purpose so somebody had a reaction to this moment. I mean, it's a good, I, I think it's a good story device, you know, because uh, in case you, maybe you're not following up with the story, then it kind of lets you know, like, oh, this is bad. Mm-mm. I can only imagine. I My dad setting up a date for me, it was going to be terrible. So we needed that groan. And then we have suddenly upbeat music and a fade out comes in with Carl still talking on the phone to end this very short scene. (laughs) This moment here, until we get to the last scene, I feel like is on fast forward from this moment. Scene five, we're at the back porch with Laura crossing her arms and looking depressed while sitting on that swinging bench. What? Oh, okay. Oh, no, no. I, no sorry. I'm confusing it with, with with her other depressed back porch moment later in the episode. I was like, wait, we're already at the end already? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is cow printed sweater depressed back porch Laura, not dance party dress depressed back porch Laura. Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Enter Eddie from the porch door, sympathetically asking Laura if she's okay. Laura says not really, and she'd like to be alone. Eddie says he understands, but then clearly doesn't as he amusingly walks over to Laura and sits next to her. I did find that moment funny. I did. I found that hilarious, and that's the perfect Big Brother moment, because that's what a Big Brother would do. They'd be like, I don't care. I'm coming out here anyways. Yep. Good comedy, Darius. Good job. Uh, He aggressively takes a seat next to Laura, like he aggressively likes to put tools on the ground, so it's just right in line with Eddie just not being delicate with anything. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Eddie suddenly becomes wisdom boy and tells Laura she's putting herself under a lot of pressure. So what if she doesn't have a big date for the dance? He continues with explaining that from years of experience, dating is no big deal. Laura takes a moment and clearly doesn't get Eddie's point when she says, say what? Eddie tells Laura that dating is overrated because when you think about it, what is a date? Dating is two very nervous people trying to think of cool things to say so that one doesn't think the other's one stupid. And then he tells Laura she should be thankful no one called her. And I, and I understand Eddie's trying to put a silver lining here and... Uh, I don't agree with the way he worded that silver lining, but I will give him points for accurately describing what dating is. In 2024, still, that's to a T what dating is. Yes. Eddie's IQ grew 30,000 points for me just from that statement alone. He knew what he was talking about. And it's that shiny moment from Eddie where it's like, okay, maybe you're not book smart, but you are going to survive in this life. Philosopher, charming Eddie. That's what he is. And Laura takes a moment to digest Eddie's attempted wisdom and just plainly says that is the biggest crotch she's ever heard in her life, which I found to be a very Cliff and Theo moment. Remember again from that first Cosby show episode where Theo was like, oh, maybe I'm not meant to have good grades, dad. And then, you know, of course, Cliff, that is the biggest crock of shit I've ever seen in my life. I'm paraphrasing. And, uh, and also, I just recommend to Laura that she just stop putting down her kind brother and listen to him for once here. Yes. Eddie really looked out for Laura in the scene. This is my favorite emotional scene between the two of them at any moment in the show where it's like they're interacting, but it's like not that brother-sister competitiveness. He just wants her to feel good. Eddie gets up from the bench and tells Laura he knows she has a crush on Mark Newhouse. So if she wants him to take her to the dance, call him and ask yourself. Fucking yes, Eddie. Being surprisingly progressive here. Regardless of gender, if you like someone, you have the ability to take the initiative and let them know. A progressive Mr. Eddie. I like you, Eddie. 
Laura insecurely asks Eddie, what if Mark doesn't want to go to the dance with her? But what if he does, Laura? Like, I, I look, I understand. I've been through that situation before, getting up the courage to ask. It's nerve wracking. But at the end of the day, you'll never know until you ask. Exactly. Laura needed this push from somebody who doesn't have fear. Like Eddie seems so fearless where he's just like, I'm just going to ask if the answer is no, it is what it is. Eddie just bluntly tells Laura she'll look like a fool if she gets rejected. Again, <laughs> may have not been the best way to word it. I, 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 I would say you might feel like a fool, Laura, and that's OK, because that's life i feel like that would have been the more compassionate response definitely he could have delivered a softer but it's eddie he's like trying to cut bread with a wrench right now is that a saying cut bread with a wrench you know it's gonna be one because i just said it (laughs) but i don't think i've ever heard anybody ever say that in life yeah you gave me the imagery of somebody going into their toolbox taking out a wrench and saying all right where's that french bread let me get into it I mean, eventually you'll do it, but it's going to take a while. And then Laura appropriately looks depressed by Eddie's response and confirms that this is the reason why she cannot call Mark. But Mark might be having the same insecurity, Laura. You know, someone's got to make the first move, right? Yeah. Every this stage. okay. so when you were trying to date somebody at this age, Sean, if you were dating, how awkward was it to be like, I like you? Or did you write the letter with like, check here if you like me or if you don't hit no? So I had an awkward dynamic back in middle school. And I'm not just saying this because I'm like blowing smoke up my ass or anything like that. Frequently, I I was told that girls liked me frequently. Mm-hmm. And I was good at being friends with girls, guys. Like I could just be my natural, funny, goofy, charming self in a friend stage. I actually got pressured whenever it was like middle school dating situations. It was always like guys, you know, coming up to my ear, like, oh, hey, you know, go out with this girl. It was always, you know, female friends, like, oh, hey, da, 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 da. and then, um, yeah, I don't know, somehow that, that peer pressure just brought me to like three day relationships with these, <laughs> with these girls where uh, I, I would just suddenly freeze up. I would just like, I, I couldn't say anything. I couldn't speak. I couldn't, you know, figure out how to do this. So that, yeah, that was that was my experience. It was never really the, oh, do you like me? And do I take you out to the day? Blah, blah, blah. No, that, that was just my experience. What about you? I didn't have that. The only time I dated was in high school. So I didn't even date in middle school at all. And in high school, I was just like, I am the trophy. Be happy that you're with me. So, <laughs> that's all I had to go on. I like that. And honestly, that's the confidence that everybody should have in the dating world. Like, hey, you should be lucky to be in my presence right now. Like, OK, maybe not so much arrogant, like, oh, I'm literally the hot shit com- and everybody is below me. But just, you know, I say a decent amount of like, hey, I'm a catch. So what do you got for me? I deserve better. I deserve great. Are you great? Are you better? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I mean. John, I'm dating right now. So dating as a person, as an adult, that's where I'm at in my life. Where I'm like, you know what? I'm happy you're here, but I'm also a catch. So let's just value each other. By the way, no, you're not dating. You're going to a dance party. Let, let's just make that clear. You're going to a dance party. You're not You're not dating. <laughs> I'm going to a dance party. <laughs> you're, you're dance partying this guy, Andrew. Oh, so Eddie just plainly tells Laura that if there's no guts, there's no glory, which is true, you know, because oftentimes, like the things that we want to have happen to us, like it starts with taking a courageous risk. So again, Eddie, where does all this wisdom come from all of a sudden? This is Grandmaster Eddie. He is philosopher and entrepreneur at this point. Mm-hmm. Eddie Winslow and the Philosopher's Stone. Ooh, I watch that. Yeah, deep cut Harry Potter reference. I don't know if you got that. I did. I'm a little Potter head, so ooh. Eddie then tells Laura he's going to shoot some hoops because suddenly he likes basketball, even though the Basketball Blues episode implied that he wasn't a big fan of basketball. Or maybe it did that just imply that he just doesn't want to do it as a career and he still kind of likes it casually. I was kind of confused by that. I was kind of confused on it, too. We've got a big continuity error here because he got the basketball, but I thought he got rid of it in the episode when he was not going to play basketball anymore. So what's happening here, Eddie? Is uh, I, I don't know. Maybe he just felt guilty for throwing Fred the basketball in the trash and decided like, hey, I'm going to give you a chance. And they're reunited and they feel so good, as Peaches and Herb would say. 
<laughs> Get out of my head. <laughs> oh, you like peaches and herb too? Like <laughs> I, I do. And as soon as you say reunited, I started singing the song in my head. <laughs> uh, fucking great song. Don't get me started on peaches and herb. Before Eddie exits through the screen door, he turns around and sweetly tells Laura that any guy who won't go out with her isn't good enough for her anyway. As Laura smiles and thanks Eddie for the compliment, we see the audience, they very audibly awe. Like they were loving this exchange. And I think you were you were as well. I was. This was a fun little moment. And we finally get to see them just be loving brother and sister. No argument has preceded this at all. And Laura, if only could just return the same kindness to Eddie, you know, rather than just be like, oh, you have the IQ of frozen yogurt. Right. Until Laura eliminates Judy, we don't get her nicely too much often. It takes Judy being sacrificed for Laura to be nice. How awfully sad is that? Incredibly. Like, Laura, darn, if you just would have been nicer sooner, maybe she would have stayed. After Eddie exits the scene, Laura gets up off the swinging bench, thinks for a moment, and then goes right inside to the kitchen toward the wall telephone where we assume she's going to be courageous and call Mark. Laura puts her hand on the phone, pulls away in hesitation, and then just goes for it and dials the number. Laura greets Mark as he picks up on the other end. She introduces herself and she says she may be risking humiliation here, but... And then there we go, Laura. She's got that classic sassy hand on hip move. Do you want to go to the dance with me or what? Obviously, a sweetly amusing moment. We criticized Laura's meanness a lot, but I was her cheerleader in this moment because it's just a relatable thing when you are just so nervous about be- becoming vulnerable romantically, and then you just work up the courage to just ask, hey, I like you. Do you want to go out with me? Good for her. But yeah, Laura did good in this, and I'm with her. Just get it out as fast as you can. There's no reason to hesitate. And she did exactly that when she just said, do you want to go with me or not? Upbeat music takes us to the next scene. Scene six, exterior night shot of Winslow House. Harriet is doing even more dish polishing in the kitchen. She's got the Rubik's Cube colored sweater. What were your thoughts on this Rubik's Cube sweater? It's an interesting sweater. I was so fearful. I was like, they've been color matching this character so often. I thought Laura was going to come down in that color scheme. Yeah, Harriet and Laura, it seems like they're both interchangeable with fashion and both with attitude. Mm -hmm. They are. They're church women, so they know exactly how to relate with each other. And uh, so the polishing, I'm just like, wow, is everything dirty in this house? Like, why is Harriet just continuously continuously polishing everything? (laughs) This is days of polishing for Harriet. This is the polishing Olympics. Rachel enters from the swinging door, happily introducing the party girl to Harriet and enter Laura. And I believe a what is it? A teal colored puffy dress. Is that teal? It's like teal and black. And Rachel uh, made this, uh, you know, Laura's you know, Laura has the black stockings and those flat ba- black ballet ish dress shoes. Is that what we call them? <laughs> yeah, I would call them still ballet shoes at that point. And Laura is smiling as if this dress actually looks good. I mean, did you like the dress? I did. I liked it. The colors I liked. I liked the puffy sleeve. I did like it, but it was still ugly. If that makes sense. I think if Laura was going to a black church in the 80s, sure, that dress is appropriate. I felt like for a school party slash dance, it just seemed a little too formal to me. Yeah, that seems more like a kid's prom dress, if that makes sense. Or Like maybe your kid's going to a wedding or something and you want the kid to have on something nice, but it didn't give me dance or party or date night dress. Were you as weird as I was when the the audience gave a loud, (laughs) whoa! It was so weird. I I was like, wait, why do we have that reaction? But then I remembered uh, Rich Carell told us about the frat boys in the audience. So I think that was the frat boys Either they got a little drunk or they were happy and they screamed for Laura. What do you think they were like? Maybe 16, 17, 14, 15? I mean, they were in a frat, so they had to be like 20 something. Oh, and saying woo to a 12 or 13 year old girl. That's not creepy at all. (laughs) Yeah, I was like, this is weird. That reaction was so weird. And I'm like, those frat boys had to be drunk or something. Like maybe they gave them a little liquor. And this was after they did their cheer for Urkel that they did this. I didn't hear too much guy in that woo. I, I heard a lot of like high pitched female in that woo. So that's very interesting that you say that. Sure, if a, Laura was an adult supermodel in a bikini, whatever, but she's not. <laughs> so uh, maybe let's place that woo for 
that. Harriet clearly loves Laura's questionable dress and says she looks beautiful as Rachel gives the most wide mouth smile I've seen. And as Harriet, what she thinks about the dress, Harriet takes a moment, looks at the dress suspiciously and says, this looks familiar. Harriet, with a playful grin, asks Rachel, didn't she make a dress like this for their Betsy Wetsy dolls when they were kids? I was drawn to that name. I was like, Betsy Wetsy. Is this like a doll who just has fun peeing on herself? <laughs> I hope he... <laughs> I hope you researched it because I thought the same thing. I was like, was this like a bean doll? Let's see if this is a, an actual real doll. Hold on. The Betsy oh, West. shit. Wikipedia says that Betsy Wetsy was a drink and wet doll. Originally, that's, that sounds so bad. A drink and wet doll originally issued by the Ideal Toy Company of New York in 1934. Uh, became one of the most popular dolls of the post-World War II baby boom era. The doll. Yeah. yeah oh, my God. The doll's special feature was simulating urination after a fluid was poured into her open mouth and also one of the first dolls to be produced in african-american versions oh that's sad so like a lot of white people their first introduction to Afri african american dolls is them peeing on themselves wow i i was joking i didn't know that there was an actual doll that peed on herself every time you gave her water that is terrible because now we're saying that like oh yeah whatever water retention that's that's not a thing <laughs> <laughs> Kids are going to be scarred when they were playing with that. Like, oh, as soon as I drink water, I'm peeing on myself. And funnily enough, 1980s, same decade that Family Matter came out, is, is when the, the Betsy Wetsy doll stopped being made. All right. I thought they were just making something up. Okay. Rachel gives a little chuckle and says yes, but only difference is that they didn't have to take Laura's arms off. Harriet then notices Laura's loose thread on the dress, and it's one of those long, loose threads where you know something bad is going to happen. And mm -hmm. then, of course, it does. The sleeve where the thread was on falls off Laura's shoulder, and all three cry out in surprise. Laura throws her arms up in shock toward her mom, and Harriet clearly shows wide mouth embarrassed shock on her face for a moment. And, and can we technically say this was another rare, clumsy Harriet moment? Yes, very rare clumsy Harriet moment, but it was good. All three of them acted well in this. They did. Rachel asks Harriet why she did that. No, I say to Rachel, it's a loose thread and anyone would pull it out. Like, you see a loose thread on something, don't you want to pull it out too? <laughs> I want to, but I know not to. Don't touch those threads. But it looks ugly when it's like left on there like that. You got to do something like the snipping it off with scissors. Will that make a difference? Once you cut that thread, if that's the thread that was holding things in place and you release the tie, then whatever you cut that thread from is done. My grandmother was big. She was like, don't you ever pull a thread? I, I just felt like the question that Rachel should have asked herself was, why couldn't you make a better dress that didn't have that thread that would have fucked up everything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, she's a better car mechanic, and I don't think putting sleeves on was her biggest feat. Harry understandably says she didn't know it was a tearaway dress. And I had to Google, because I've, I've, have you heard the term tearaway dress? <laughs> I have. I've seen them. Whenever you go to drag shows, you learn what a tearaway is. So is that like, oh, like I can just take Velcro and just tear this dress apart? Or is it something else? It's not always Velcro, but it could be like a sleeve comes off or maybe a panel on it, it comes off. Or like if you've ever seen like go-go dancers, like the guys, they rip their pants off. Those are tearaway clothes. Oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. Yeah, because when I looked it up on Google, they gave me something called transformation dresses, which work by concealing the inside dress completely inside the outer dress and sometimes cloaks. The shirt is torn away either by Velcro snaps or a cord and falls down under a longer skirt. So is that still a tearaway dress, maybe? <laughs> that could be. That could be a tearaway dress. There's a whole episode of Drag Race, John, that I'll have to send you over. And they just wear tearaways the entire episode. And you get to see what some tearaways look like. All right. I'm curious about that. Laura cries out in a parliament, asking what she's going to do because she cannot go to the dance like this. Rachel tries to comfort Laura by saying she can fix this and instructs Harriet to get her some thread. Harriet agrees, but anxiously tells Rachel to hurry because Laura does not have much time. This is a great comedic moment, by the way. Rachel comes back with a gaslighting-ish sort of line. Well, there'd be plenty of time if someone didn't pull out one of the threads. Exclaiming to Harriet that she doesn't see her yanking out other people's threads because she knows better. She knows why threads are there. They're there to keep the dress on. And then she quickly starts to Laura and then orders her to get up the stairs. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> Great moment. <laughs> yeah. And then, and also during Rachel's rant, you know, Harriet is like doing an anxious physical back and forth between the kitchen and the swinging door. Like, okay, I got to go get the thread, Rachel, but you're talking to me. So I guess I should listen to you in the kitchen. And it was just, uh, wow. I, 
was telling Rachel, shut up and just let Harriet do her job. But also I was saying, Talma, like, you're, you're so phenomenal. They were both so good in the scene. This was probably the best well-acted scene in this episode. And then we cut to the living room as Harriet races toward the white... I was trying to figure out what this thing was called. I, I, I called it a white grayish cabinet thing where she was trying to look for the thread. What do you call that structure? I I called it a cabinet. I was also thinking like um like a China shelf, but I don't know if that works. Okay, we'll call it a China shelf. Um, and it's by the front door in the living room where I guess the, this thread is located. Enter a police uniform, Carl. He's happily greeting Harriet like he did earlier. And he's conveniently coming from the front door instead of the back porch door because, you know... <laughs> We, we, God forbid, Carl enters where the scene is not. <laughs> right. They'll be like, how did Carl get in this house? <laughs> I mean, I, it wouldn't be that awkward if Carl entered from the back porch door if the scene was currently in the living room. Like, it, it would just, like, hi, honey. Like, we hear Carl's voice and then he just slowly walks into the living room. But no, he always has to enter where the scene currently is at the moment. <laughs> in the 80s, John, they had indicators to let you know what side of the house people were on, and that's the side you enter. So that's what Carl's doing. Harriet anxiously goes through this cabinet thing. She is warning Carl that dinner is going to be late because she's helping Laura get ready for the dance. Carl has a knowing smile on his face while pretending to not know this info till now and says he had a feeling Laura would get a date. Carl asks if Steve, whoops, oh, Carl just realized his mistake and corrects himself. He then asks if a boy in general happened to call. Harriet says yes, and that Laura is getting ready now. Doorbell rings. Harriet anxiously tells Carl to get the door while she goes to help Rachel, and then she exits up the stairs. Carl goes to answer the door, and in enters innocently grinned Steve Urkel with, I think I think he had like a navy blue suit, white collared button down, crooked bow tie, glasses are largely rimmed as you want them to be. He's got the string going around his ears. He's got flowers. And then, you know, he has that nerdy nasally delivery as he introduces himself. Hi, Mr. Winslow. I'm Steve Urkel. And then Carl looks Steve up and down as if he's a weirdo. Steve asks Carl if Laura is ready for the dance. The audience laughs at that line, too. And that's going to, I think, start this thread, fittingly enough, throughout the episode where Steve says lines that, when you look at them on the script, it's like, oh, that's just a casual thing to say. But because of how he delivers it, the audience just thinks it's like the biggest joke ever. They do. The audience loves it. And I swear it's those frat boys. Those frat boys infected the audience and everybody's participating now. Those pounds and beers, bro. <laughs> Carl hesitatingly tells Steve to come right in and Laura will be right down. Steve enters and looks around the house anxiously for Laura for a moment and then tells Carl that when his dad said that Carl fixed him up with Laura, he thought he'd wet his pants. Steve is so precious in this moment. Yeah. And, you know, of course, audience has a big laugh at that. I quietly chuckled. I, You know, Julio, he's adorable. How can you not like him? He's, he's quite a talent. He really is. And he played this so well. He really did. Laughter dies down from the audience. Steve resumes and says he's been crazy about Laura since the first grade, but she always thought he was some kind of a freak. And then Steve throws his arms up in a very delighted way as he says, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed this entire scene and I love that Steve is oblivious to him being a nerd. Yeah, he's oblivious, Eddie, except... Steve. He's oblivious Steve. Oblivious Steve. Intelligent Steve. And Oh, did you notice this? So uh, after he was like, go figure, like waves his arms up, he then follows it up with his like nerdy pig snort laugh. But you can't hear it because the audience is fucking laughing so loud. <laughs> I didn't catch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I caught it. Like, like I, I can't do it because it's, it's it's such effort to do it. But um, yeah, no, no. He just was just doing the nerdy pig snort laugh right after the go figure line. And the audience is just drowning out that snort because they're still laughing from what he just said. That is awesome. Come through, Urkel. Carl Black is a big, polite and clearly nervous smile as he tells Steve he didn't know Laura felt that way and then remarks that he brought nice flowers. Steve thanks Carl for the compliment and says on the way over, he stopped by the cemetery. Carl then takes a step back in slight disgust because of course, who knows how much dead people dust is in those flowers. There's tons of dead people. Those are the flowers of the undead. No. Carl suggests to Steve that he go in the kitchen and wash off the roots. Steve tells Carl that's a good idea, then walks toward the direction of the kitchen. Uh, Steve then stops and turns around to Carl to say what he thinks is a compliment, but it is really not. Nice house for a cop. 
you know, interesting line. I mean, I know I, I think we touched on this like in the second episode where Harriet got laid off. But uh, like my cousin in Connecticut, he's a cop making a lot of fucking money. But I guess back then uh, to, to be a cop, maybe a Chicago centric thing. It was kind of like, oh, you're slumming it. You're, you're not making as much. I would imagine hearing that reference, thinking about what it was to be a cop, and especially Carl being a Black cop, he was probably underpaid more than anybody else in his department. So it's, I guess it's not surprising to hear somebody say this is a nice house for a cop, but you would think because he's the lead character on our show, it would be expected he's making money. Yeah, hopefully he makes more as we go forward. Carl gives a frown that amuses me and sarcastically thanks Steve. And then as Steve starts to continue walking toward the kitchen, he bumps into a small glass table positioned to the left of the center couch and it drops to the floor pretty audibly. There you go. We get some slapstick comedy there. Uh, Steve clumsily attempts to put the table back where it belonged with the paperwork and some giant phone book, I think it was. Mm -hmm. yeah, was it a giant phone book? It was. It was the phone book. Okay, thank you. And I believe he... Did, did he break the glass on top of this table? Because then, then when he tried to put the phone book and the paperwork back on the table, it just kind of dropped through. Either he didn't put the glass back or it broke and we didn't get a glass break sound, but I screamed. It was a hilarious moment. They have a stock glass crashing sound effect that they've used already on the show, so they could have used that for the glass table. They could have. I mean, come on, production. Y'all should have gave us a glass break. As Steve exits to the kitchen, Carl clearly looks speechless and then stretches his arms out to the heavens and asks, what have I done? And little does he know that he's in for a long ride with this kid. Carl does not know that he literally brought this kid into his life forever just from this one moment. Kill your son-in-law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Carl then walks toward the bottom of the stairs to call out to Laura, and then we could tell he's nervous in his tone as he says, uh, Laura, your uh, date is here. Rachel anxiously comes downstairs and asks if he's really here and pleads to Carl to stall him because she still has to put Laura's dress together and she can't work under this kind of pressure. And then Rachel just frantically runs through the living room toward the Mama Winslow bathroom area as she audibly does the anxious self-talk with herself. <laughs> like, Rachel has just lost it by now. <laughs> We are looking at manic Rachel. She is in a manic state and nobody can stop her. And of course, Carl gives that look like, what the hell is going on? And then enter Eddie from the living room door with that headphone sky we saw in line at Leroy. So oh, there's Tyrone. Oh, Tyrone is here. He's finally arrived. Yeah. I, anytime I hear Tyrone, I want to be that guy that enters the house, like maybe like a house party. Tyrone, hello. It, yeah, you have to do it if you ever meet somebody named Tyrone. But I am with you. I imagine Tyrone walks into the house party and everybody wants to talk to him. Tyrone! Like, it just, <laughs> like, it has that very call and response feel to it. It does. Or Erica Badu. Because I was singing Don't Call Tyrone when I was watching this episode. Oh, is that a song from Erica Badu? I did not know that. Oh my gosh, you have to listen to Tyrone by Erica Badu. It's delicious. Is it about a guy named Tyrone that she hated that she was with? Yes. Don't make her call Tyrone. You don't want him on the phone. Eddie introduces his dad to who we now know as Tyrone. And it's strange that Eddie and Tyrone, uh, I don't think they ever acknowledge each other at all at Leroy's. No, they don't acknowledge each other at all. They barely even acknowledge each other in this scene when he introduces Tyrone to Laura. <laughs> yeah, some friend you guys are. Carl tells Tyrone it's nice to meet him as he shakes his hand. Eddie reveals to his dad that Tyrone is taking Laura to the dance. As Eddie and Tyrone start to walk through the living room, Carl stops them with a whoa, 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 and asks Eddie what he means by Tyrone taking Laura to the dance. Eddie pridefully says he felt sorry for Laura and gave Tyrone 10 bucks to take her. Jesus Christ, Eddie Winslow, basically giving your sister a teenage male escort for the night. I mean, it was a nice gesture. And you know what? My older friends, if you needed an escort, I'd pay for like somebody to go with you to events or something. But this dude is too old. He is too old. He's like Eddie's age. I'm like, this is a little weird. Yeah. And Eddie, I think maybe he's like, what, 15, 16, 14, give or take. I think he's like 15, 16, something like that. Yeah. And we got to remember, like when you're in a like when you're in your adult stage, like say if it's like a 33 year old or a 43 year old going out, who the fuck cares when you're in that uh, 10 to 20 era 
a 12 year old going out with a 16 year old. I mean, that it, it might as well be the equivalent of like an 80 year old going out with a 20 year old. It's just, it's really weird. There's such an age difference. There's such a life change. It's yeah. Yeah, it's very cringy. It's just weird. And I'm just like, Eddie, what were you thinking for this one? Oh, God. Carl tells Eddie he already set Laura up with Steve Urkel. Eddie asks Carl if he means <laughs> mouse eater Steve Urkel. They should have, you know, honestly, this should have been a, like a reoccurring thing. I felt like they only like kept this characteristic in this episode. I don't think I ever heard a mouse eating reference ever since this episode, but I would have loved it if they kept this going. Yeah, like, because I know there uh, has been an episode where Steve was like loopy from something, maybe from one of his experiments. They should have just had him eating mice while he was loopy. They should have. Oh, my God, John, that would have been phenomenal. And, but then he did have that white mouse he always carried around with him once one season where he had like a big white mouse. So maybe that's why they're like, oh, we can't call him Mouse Eater because he's going to have a mouse as a friend. Mm, I vaguely remember that. I vaguely remember that. Okay, okay. Carl asked in disbelief, he eats mice? Eddie says it's probably just a rumor and then asks Carl if Laura knows Steve is taking her. Carl claims that Laura does know, but more importantly, has anyone actually seen Steve eat a mouse? Good call. We need the evidence because it's such a strange thing. And it's like a mouse eater doesn't correctly describe what he's about. <laughs> It doesn't. And I love that Carl's like, has anybody seen him eat the mouse? But I kind of was waiting for him to say, has anybody seen where this child has gone in my house right now? That too. That would be actually a valid question. Eddie tells his dad he's got better things to do than watch Steve Urkel eat. Eddie asks what he's going to do about Tyrone because he already gave him the 10 bucks and Tyrone just not silently in agreement with those headphones on, which I don't know. I was like, oh, Tyrone can listen to the conversation. So he's not really listening to music. He's just having that headphone thing as a fashion choice. Possibly. He could be this a headphone wearer, no music, which some people do. I do it when I don't want people to talk to me. And I'm just noticing Tyrone's fashion here. How about that oversized gray suit coat, black and white line faded button down that I swear I have a shirt just like that, I think, still at my house. Oh, John, you have to wear it at some point. Yeah, shamefully, it's not something that was like back in the day. It was like something that was more recent. I think it's one of my more recent dress shirts. So maybe I un awaringly bought Tyrone's shirt. Possibly you did, John. You're bringing back 80s fashion. Harriet and Laura come down the stairs and Harriet satisfyingly says the new dark red dress Laura has on looks even better. And a smiling Laura seems to agree. And look, I mean, it's not puffy ugly like Rachel's disaster, which is good. I think it's a better looking dress, but it's, it's, it's still too church child formal for me. It is. It's Sunday dress. Like, I feel like after Rachel's dress broke, after Harriet broke it, even though Rachel didn't do it right, mm -hmm. I just feel like Laura's like little red dress is like Easter Sunday or maybe like a Sunday service or maybe even a funeral. God, three guys are going to want to go out with me. That's so sad. <laughs> Laura was in her goth stage. She was triggering <laughs> her goth moment. <laughs> I'm having so much success in this world, but I don't want to have that because it's more cool to be depressed. That was Laura. That's why she chose that color. Harriet tells Laura she looks wonderful. Laura thanks her mom for the compliment. Eddie tells Laura to look who's here, Tyrone. Laura awkwardly says hi to Tyrone, clearly not knowing why he's here. Eddie confirms to Laura that Tyrone is her date for the night. As Tyrone walks over to Laura, she simply says, no, he's not. Eddie insists he is because he gave Tyrone 10 bucks. Laura, uh, understandably, hands on hips, shocked, asks Eddie if he really hired Tyrone to take her to the dance. Harriet gives an audibly disappointed, oh, Eddie. And then, <laughs> oh, fucking Carl, I love him. Like his funniest fake disappointed take, oh, Eddie. I love it. Carl knew what he was doing. He's like, oh, let me try to pin this all on Eddie. You can tell he's trying to cover his tracks. Laura tells Eddie she doesn't need charity and cannot believe he did this. Carl continues to put on a performance and tells Eddie his sister is right and she can find her own dates. Eddie interjects with a, but dad. And then Carl quickly cuts him off with a fake drama. <laughs> I don't want to hear about it. Harriet defends Eddie to Laura and says she's sure he was trying to do something nice, which, you know, th that was your argument. You know, you you saw the nice gesture. Cynical uh, beer belly me was just like, oh, this is creepy. This is escort act. <laughs> I mean, I'm still with you on your side that it is still creepy, but it was meant to be a good gesture. Like Eddie was like, hey, I purchased you a boyfriend for the night because you need one. <laughs> 
<laughs> purchased. It just seems like slavery is happening right now. I just I, I bought this valuable boyfriend that I found on a slave ship. He's he's available for ten dollars for the hour. Here, you're welcome. <laughs> Eddie was channeling his colonized history. I <laughs> I guess. Oh boy! Doorbell rings. Carly, uh, Car- Carl weirdly shoes everyone away to go answer it. I don't know why. He was like so eager, like ah, because like uh, Steve already came in. So why is he right. so eager to answer the door? Like oh, everybody get it. I don't know. Maybe he forgot that Steve was there. I mean, it's hard. It's hard to not notice him. He's a big presence. He is. I I was trying to figure that out when he shooed everybody from the door because I'm like, who did he expect to walk through the store then? And when Carl answers the door, in comes Mark Newhouse with that very 80s patterned gray suit. He's got the dark and light blue and white boxed pattern collar shirt. And I think he had a dark blue tie. Was it dark blue? It was a dark blue tie. Mark looked cool. Like he was like the cool kid coming to pick up Laura. Yep. Yep. And again, uh, he is wearing clothes that don't fit him, just like Tyrone, because that's what we just did back in the day. And I love how he formally introduces himself. Hi, I'm Mark Newhouse. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> no, because I feel like, I mean, what did you, uh, it, like the more casual thing, like, oh, hey, I'm Mark. I'm here for Laura. Like, even if you nervously said that, like it would have been more casual than, hi, I'm Mark Newhouse. <laughs> I feel like they didn't know what to do for him to introduce himself. So they're like, just go in there and say your name generically and don't do anything else. Yeah. Like we already know your name. We, you, you, your name was already said before. So you could just say a hi, I'm Mark. <laughs> right. He could just be like, I'm Mark, nothing else. There was no new house needed. Yeah. And also like the last name wasn't even needed at all in this episode because who else is named Mark? Nobody's named Mark, but him. Nobody. Everybody is the same. So I feel like they did it for no reason and just didn't take out his last name. Laura kindly tells Mark to come on in because this is her actual date that she consented to. Carl confusingly asks what Mark is doing here. Laura confirms to her dad that Mark is her date. Carl is flabbergasted when he asks, your date? And then Eddie gives... Remember Eddie, like, like Eddie was just like giving that like really funny, like, ah, I see I'm not the only one who fucked up grin. Like he was just nodding to Carl. Uh, I loved it. Yeah, it was, it, it gave me SpongeBob Squidward vibes when, uh, God, what was that episode of SpongeBob where, uh, oh, oh, it, I, I think like Squidward was like going on and on about how he hates the taste of Krabby Patties, blah, 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 blah. And then <laughs> SpongeBob discovered that Squidward ate a Krabby Patty, like his face like his eyes and his face just like rose up to the top of his head, like as he was giving the most exaggerated smile ever, like, oh, Squidward. <laughs> <laughs> that is the most funny moment in SpongeBob. That's exactly what I got from Eddie. So Harriet in prideful defense of Laura says Mark is indeed her date. And why else does he think she's been getting all dressed up? And I was like, wow, Harriet, she just did a change here. I mean, before she was doing the dramatic black mom thing where Laura was going to get married at 13 and die at 30 if she went on a date now. And now she's like, oh, yeah, sure. I'm fine with this date. Harriet had a full shift. I think once she saw Laura in her dress and she's like, oh, my daughter's so beautiful and happy. Harriet's all on board. She's like, this date is happening. That's often what can happen with uh, certain black moms when you show them the reality. Like, I remember when, again, going back to when my mom was just being dramatic about me moving to Iowa, like, oh, you're going to be so far away from us. You don't know anybody. You're going to get killed by a white cop. And then when, uh, you know, she helped me move along with everybody else in my family and saw like the size of my apartment and and, yeah, all of a sudden the tone changed. Like, oh, okay, you're going to be okay. (laughs) Yeah, but sometimes moms just need that reality where it's like, everything's fine, your baby's good, just chill. Carl is silent for a moment and then quickly tries to avoid trouble by politely showing Mark and Laura to the door and wishing them a good time at the dance. And then, boom, Steve Urkel loudly, happily greets Laura as he enters the living room from the kitchen with flowers still in hand. Carl clearly looking frightened at what is happening right now. And the front door in the living room goes from being open when Mark and Laura were about to exit to just slowly closing. Big reveal here. Steve tells Laura the flowers are for her. And then I knew this line was coming because I've seen this episode before. I mean, certain, just certain certain moments, you know, from Steve Urkel's debut, just like kind of pinpoint in your mind, like a sound bite. So it says that the flowers are for her and then suddenly exclaims, wow, I'm wearing a bra. <laughs> that is such an iconic moment. That line has been stuck in my head ever since I was a kid. And, and you know what? Dare I say, we might we, we may have to start making some Steve Urkel catchphrase shirts. 
that have never been made before. Because everybody, of course, references, did I do that? But how about the earlier ones? Well, are you wearing a bra? I almost wet my pants. <laughs> yes. I want a, ooh, Steve Urkel with the duck. I forgot what he said with the duck in his hands, but I want something like that. Those catchphrases that we got that weren't commonplace would be yeah. amazing on shirts. This is my quackers. Estelle watches him a lot. <laughs> <laughs> just a shirt with him saying Estelle. The way he says Estelle is lovely. Yeah, right. Like he like like they like they they play backgammon every Thursday night at eight. <laughs> him and Mama Winslow, they're down like that. That's his eighth moon. They are like there together in the trenches. But also, I thought that like that that line. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Was it a tad? Did it seem a tad risque for a kid to say in a family friendly sitcom that time? Like, oh damn. We're going to try to avoid the dating conversation, but we're just going to openly come out and say that Laura is wearing a bra. <laughs> yeah, it was. I didn't expect to hear it. But then also I was like, OK, a nerdy thing to do would be to point out someone's bra. Harriet, with a look of confusion, asked Steve who he is and why are those flowers dripping on her floor? And going back to Harriet's mom energy, like that's uh, that you, you, you know, that multitasking line of questioning, you know, where you're, you're just able to put put everything all together at once, two or three things together. Um, hi, who are you and why are you wearing shoes in my house? <laughs> yes. And Harriet spent a week polishing this house and Steve is messing it up. Yeah. And somehow the dripping issue isn't really addressed. They just let him still hold the flowers and just carry on. Like, oh, hey, like the flowers are dripping. That's a problem. But OK, we're just going to deal with this other thing for now. <laughs> right. They never address the dripping flowers again. Like take the flowers away from Steve and put it somewhere else, Harriet, if it concerns you so much. Make a choice rather than constantly polishing dishes that don't need to be polished. You know, put the flowers on the dish that she polished and the water won't be on the floor. There you go. There you go. Carl claims he can explain this and tries to cover his ass by suggesting to Steve that he called the house to ask Laura on a date. Steve thinks for a moment and clearly is not with Carl and genuinely says, why should he have called? Because his dad said Carl set it all up. And then we hear a little gasp from some in the audience at this reveal. And again, Laura doing that hands on hip shocked thing, but it becomes more pronounced this time. She walks over to her dad and says, you did what? As Carl attempts to explain himself, a very pissed Laura cuts in to exclaim that she cannot believe this and she's never been so embarrassed in her life. And then this is the, the, the awkward dramatic exit that I was talking about. She seemed to be doing this weird sliding half run on her ballet dress shoes toward the kitchen. It just wasn't smooth at all. It was just like, ah, I'm mad at you all. <laughs> <laughs> Just just run, run. They're flats. They run. You could do it. When I saw her do that, I'm like, they must have rehearsed this since she fell or something, because it was the most awkward run I've ever seen. Harriet tries to break the tension for the moment and says thank you to, I think, Steve. Did she say thank you to Steve? I think she said thank you to Steve. And then definitely asked Steve, what's your name, sugar? And the audience laughs at Steve simply saying his first name. So again, I mean, that's a great testament to Julia White's comedy chops. I mean, if people are just laughing at you saying things that aren't meant to be funny, then oh, maybe you should stay around for a while. Yeah. Steve really ate this episode up and the audience, they loved him. Now I keep referring to the frat boys, but I think just genuinely they loved him and people wanted to like show it. Frat boys just undercover were giving, hopefully, uh, of age people, like, hey, you know, let's have some shots. Let's have a good time watching this nerdy character. <laughs> I can see them bringing in just cold brews and just, like, passing them out to everybody in the crowd and, like, just chug it, bro. Twisted tea, vodka, fireball. Let's all mix it all together into one and let's drink. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my stomach hurts. Ugh. Harriet tells Steve and Tyrone that they won't be needed tonight. Eddie tells Tyrone to come on, let's bail because the date is over. And Tyrone just exits out the door with Eddie without saying a word ever in this episode. I mean, I wonder if this kid got paid a decent amount of money because I know that they usually pay you by the line in the, uh, in the actor's union. I hope that he got paid something, hopefully something good. But he literally just stood there and he stole his moments with his gestures and facial expressions. So and hopefully he, they paid him for that. 
And he doesn't come back, does he? I don't think so. I don't think he's ever seen again in another episode. Okay, we'll see if he's still alive and we'll see if we can get the actor on. I think that would be great. <sighs> It'd be funny if he tells us I was listening to classical music the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was just listening to Bette Midler, Barbra Streisand, while I was trying to, you know, encapsulate this hip hop teenager vibe from the 80s. Oh, that would be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. We are left with Carl, Mark, and Steve standing center stage in front of the couch. You, you know, Carl and Mark, they're seeming to get the awkwardness of the moment. But then, of course, you have like nerdy, goofy, smiling Steve with his flowers. Uh, the audience is loving Steve just smiling, not being aware of how awkward this is. Then Carl rolls his eyes. We get an abrupt fade out from this scene. Uh, we go to scene seven. We fade into the back porch as the camera slowly pans from Harriet entering to a shot of Laura with arms crossed, looking hurt by what just happened. Harriet quietly asks Laura if she wants to talk. L uh, Laura asks her mom if she has any idea how humiliating this is. Harriet acknowledges to Laura that her father and Eddie acted like fools, but they meant well. Laura calls it for what it is. Carl and Eddie paid guys to go out with her. And I mean, look, it's something I expect from Eddie, but I know that Carl has been goofy, but I, I feel like I would have expected a little better from Carl, maybe a little more common sense. I 100% agree with you. Like just the concept of purchasing a date for your daughter and she doesn't know at all. It's like, this is going to be embarrassing for her. It gives me arranged marriage vibes. Ooh, Carl had the dowry. He was ready. <laughs> is that an Indian thing? I have no idea what you just said. I think dowry was Indian. Okay, because I know that it, the, the Indian culture celebrates arranged marriages usually, so I thought you were referencing an Indian thing. I think I am. <laughs> I'm the only thing I think I am because I just know that word. Harriet tries to lighten the mood by saying she's sure dad did not pay Steve a cent, but it doesn't help as Laura sadly says this is the worst day of her life. Now, it doesn't have to be because vis-a-vis, when Alan was waiting for Rachel back in episode four, there's a nice guy named Mark still waiting for her. Good things can still happen from this night. Right. There's still good things that can happen from this night. And if, we, if Laura, if you want to flex, you can always be like, oh, girls, how many men came to pick you up? And then she can say, I had three. Right. To make it even better, she was the one that asked her key guy to go out with her. So she took the initiative and he still managed to pick her up. So there you go. It all worked out in the end. It really did. Laura had a bit of a good moment here. Harriet tells Laura she should be happy because a very nice boy asked her to the dance. Laura thankfully tells her mom that Mark did not ask her. She asked him. Harriet reacts disbelievingly. And what I found to be a weird way, she was like, you did? Oh. Like, it was like, oh, they, was it wrong? Was it odd that Laura asked Mark herself? Like, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. And I was trying to figure out Harriet's reaction here. Was she kind of like, oh, Laura, you went out and your way and asked somebody? Or was she kind of like, oh, I'm surprised that he said yes. Harriet comes in for the silver lining and says, at least Mark said yes. There you go. And that should tell Laura something. So maybe it was like, oh, well, it's kind of not normal for the girl to take to make the first move so thankfully he said yes to that like I, maybe that's what the implication was <laughs> maybe i think maybe that's it john i'm gonna go with that maybe she's kind of like okay i'm happy he said yes because this is not normal for a girl to ask laura gives some surprising information when she tells her mom that mark had a fight with his girlfriend and was looking to laura as a rebound and would have gone out with anybody and i was like well geez kind of a fuck you to mark here because i don't know i just don't like the idea of laura being a backup option. Yeah, I don't like Laura being a backup option. I don't like that she considers herself a backup option because you are the prize, Laura. You're not a backup. As you would think of yourself, Andrew, you are the trophy. Mm -hmm. You are the trophy and the money. You're all of it. Laura is making me both uncomfortable and also kind of sad when she asks her mom what's wrong with her. Then we get sappy piano background music playing as Harriet tells Laura there's nothing wrong with her because she's smart, funny, has a great personality. Uh, Laura kind of puts me off with this line, great personality, so I'm ugly then. Like, ugh, God, I hate that stereotype. Like, oh, you got to either have a good personality or be very attractive. No, there, there are some attractive people with good personalities out there. They're very true. It's a whole spectrum. And I like this moment because Harriet's there to encourage Laura and be like, no, you're not some girl that's just is going to be considered ugly because we already know how fashion and stuff worked around then. You didn't really see many black models of people on TV. So it was nice to see her say like, no, you're beautiful. And it's just that these are the guys. It's not you. 
Harriet insists to Laura, she's not ugly, she's beautiful. Laura asks, why didn't Mark ask her out himself? Laura, because, you know, we cannot control what other people think and what their actions will be. It has nothing to do with you. Harriet tells Laura that boys are scared to death just like her, but that will change. And I like how Harriet acknowledges that boys can be scared too, because I think that some would kind of have this assumption that, oh, the boys are the confident ones. The girls are maybe the insecure, nervous ones. And no, not necessarily. My mom, when I was growing up, she just kind of, you know, whenever I expressed nerves about a dating experience or whatever, like she just simply chalked it up to, oh, don't worry about it. Like, you know, be confident. You're supposed to be confident. And it's like, well, confidence helps, but it's also okay to have these feelings of nervousness because it can often show that you care, that you really want this experience to be a fruitful experience. Yeah, it's like what Eddie said earlier. Dating is just two nervous people not knowing what to say. And it's the same thing when you get to know somebody or ask them out. It's like someone's going to be nervous or both of you are going to be nervous and it's okay to be nervous. You don't just have to be confident all the time. So being nervous and even better talking about how nervous you are, like that's that can make a big difference to the other person expressing that. Like that can ironically go a long way to the path to confidence. I found that to be true. I agree. When you can relate to somebody and say, hey, I'm feeling this emotion and they say, oh, my God, I'm feeling this emotion, too. It makes you even closer. Laura tells her mom that dating is hard and Harriet says it's hard for everyone. Harriet admits to Laura that it took dad six weeks to work up the courage to ask Harriet out. But she's glad he did. Harriet then physically motions to Laura to come on and get up off the bench so she can dust off those shoulders and start anew. Harriet encourages Laura to go back into the house with Mark because she thinks he likes Laura. Laura asks her mom how she can tell. And Harriet says she's a mother and just has a feeling about these things. Laura hugs her mom and thanks her as she exits into the house. We see Harriet still on the back porch with a satisfying grin toward Laura. And then once she sees the coast is clear, Harriet prays to the Lord that Mark actually likes Laura. And then she exits into the house as well. Remember that moment? Oh, please, Lord, let this boy like Laura. Uh, or uh, what was it? Let this boy like Laura or let Laura like him? I can't remember. I think it was let this boy like Laura. Ah, got it. And if Mark doesn't, that's OK. Laura will live. <laughs> Laura will live. She'll be perfectly fine. Cut to living room with a nervously pacing Carl and then enter Laura from the swinging door, ignoring her dad's physical attempt to apologize and going right to Mark to ask if he still wants to go to the dance with her. Mark says, sure. And he's glad Laura called and he's liked her for a long time. But yet, Mark, you chose this other girl and you looked at Laura as a backup option the whole time. Fuck you, Mark Newhouse. I was so into Mark Newhouse until that information was revealed. I was like, no, I don't know. Maybe maybe you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. But I was just like, no, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt because I know how stupid boys can be because I was a stupid boy. And if there was somebody I would like, I'd be like, oh, I'm going to go out with this other person to make them jealous. Meanwhile, the whole time the other person wants to go out with me and I just was too dumb to ask. So, Mark, I'm going to give you just the little dumb boy thumbprint right now that you should have just asked Laura. The audience awes. We see Harriet give Laura a warm grin and a wink. Laura tells her mom good night as she and Mark walk toward the living room front door to exit. Harriet tells the kids good night and hopes they have a good time. But before Mark leaves, Harriet pulls him by his suit and reminds him to not be late coming back and then pats him on the shoulder with that parental smile that definitely lets you know if Mark is not going to come back on time. He's going to be toast. Oh, Harriet put the fear of God in him with that one little statement. Well, Laura may die at 30, but you'll die at 13 if you don't bring her back home on time, Mark. <laughs> Poor Mark. He was so scared. <laughs> mm -hmm. After Harriet closes the door on Mark and Laura, crazy Rachel coming back into the living room. The ugly, puffy dress she's trying to fix. She has that with her. She exclaims to Laura that she got it. She got it. And just as Rachel is about to head up the stairs to where she thinks Laura still is, Harriet calls out to her to state that Laura is gone. But don't feel bad because Laura can wear that dress to her next date. Harriet, if you love your daughter, I, in my opinion, you will not let her come anywhere near that dress. And don't wear that dress out. It is hideous. And just as I'm wondering where Steve went, 
And he wa- did, did you wonder? I was like, where, where, where is the Urkel man? <laughs> I was like, where's this child at? How did they just let this child explore their house? Yeah, because he's such a big character. And to the fact that he just goes from like, oh, hey, I'm Steve. I'm in your face to just like, oh, he's just gone. <laughs> it was weird. But uh, he comes uh, from Mama Winslow's bathroom area, walks in, humming some tune to himself. Finally, without dripping flowers in hand. And as Steve walks, this is where I'm noticing Jaleel. Like, he's displaying little hints of his signature posture. Like, I, I don't know. I just I was, I was seeing it in his arms. Like, he's trying to figure it out. Like, okay, can the Urkel man do this? Can the Urkel man do that? So, you know, we're, we're going to see as we keep on deep diving into this show, we're going to really see the evolution of this character. Because I think if you just like kind of vaguely see it when you're a kid or you see the reruns, you, you know, it's just out of context. But like we're actually seeing this in order. So it'll be interesting to see how he finds this character. It really will. It's so cool to see him develop this character as it goes on. But this first like little introductory that we have here now officially, it felt like I was watching Urkel Light and we didn't pay for the ads yet. <laughs> That's a perfect description. I like that. Anywho, Steve walks toward Carl, Harriet, and Rachel as they're attempting to process who this weird human being is. And particularly Carl and Rachel, I loved their very animated, disgusting, confused facial expressions. Did you pick up on it? <laughs> yes. They were looking at him like, what is happening right now with this child? God, they, I love face acting. Reginald and especially Telma lately. Telma has been doing some interesting face acting. They both have been, and they make statements with their faces, so it's good to see. And, and so does Joe Marie. Joe Marie obviously has that, you know, very sassy frown, like, what did you say? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then we can't forget, uh, Loretta, we've got Way to Go Carl face. So oh, we've yeah. got some good face acting. Yeah, Rosetta with her Way to Go Carl. Yep, that's why we have it on the T-shirt. Yes! Steve Urkel says he hopes they don't mind him staying a while because his parents told him not to come home until 10. And I was questioning to myself, I was like, what are, are Steve's parents sick of him? Uh, they, they, uh, and, and the potential of all the comedic and dramatic material that we could have gotten had Herb and Diane actually shown up and showed a, uh, a clear exhaustion over the craziness of their son. Yes. If we would have known this first episode would have been a great time to introduce them. So we'd be like, oh, he's a terror at home too. What if Herb was the same Herb from Peaches and Herb? Wouldn't that be weird? That would be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Steve plops himself down on the Winslow Center couch and while holding a magazine, he, he asks Carl, uh, Rachel, and Harriet, remember this? Do you have any cheese? <laughs> the look on their faces. <laughs> And then for some reason, music fades us into another scene. I felt like that would have been the perfect way to end the episode. Like, Mama Winslow's way to go, Carl. Do you have any cheese? Credits roll up. Come on, let's end it. But for whatever reason, we seem to be into starting a new scene when there's like a fucking 50 seconds left in the episode. <laughs> right, it should have ended right there. We should have been done. Scene eight, exterior night shot of Winslow House with fucking one minute and 54 seconds. I looked at the timer, one minute and 54 seconds. Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right, night shot zooms into the lower right window of the house. Then we cut to the living room where Carl and Harriet are cuddling together on the center couch watching TV. In enters Laura from the front door with her dressy overcoat. And Carl happily asks, how was his little girl's first date? As Laura unbuttons her coat and walks by her parents, she just says it was okay. Carl asks, that's it? Just okay? Laura then explains that for about three hours, the guy's stood on one side of the room and the girl stood on the other side and she mostly ended up talking to her friend Penny, which she could have done at home. I would say I've been fascinated by this stereotype of how school dances are in pop culture. Like, it's always like, oh, the guys are over here. The girls are over here. You know, the guys are too afraid to talk to the girls. So let's just hang with my boys and hang with the girls. And nobody has the courage to ask. I don't know if your school dances were like this, but my fucking school dances could not have been more different. We, if there were chaperones there, they, they, they had to get people off of each other because the amount of grinding, the amount of touching, the amount of groping that was happening at seventh and eighth grade in the middle school time frame, it was was insane. I've probably found my sexuality in those school dances, which is weird to say because 
now looking back, it's like, oh my God, I was only 11, 12, 13 years old, but the hormones were raging. We were humping, we were grinding. Usher's Yeah was playing, you know, whatever, all the all the early 2000s hip hop was going on right now. Were your school dances like that or were they as innocent as the Family Matters ones? My school dances were the Family Matters dances. Like what? literally the guys on one side, the girls on one side, nobody interacting with each other. And just standing around and maybe talking about whatever video game you were playing with the guys. And then, of course, I had friends who were girls. So I would go over to the girls. I'm like, oh, go dance and go do something. And they would look at me like I'm crazy. Like, we're not going to go dance. And then at the last, like, 15 minutes, everybody comes and dances. Exactly like this moment here. That's what Laura says. I mean, Harriet asked Laura if she danced at all. Laura says a little. When there was about 15 minutes left, Mark finally got up the nerve to ask her to dance, and then they had a really good time. What is it with waiting until the last minute? I guess after a while, you just get tired of being nervous, and you just are like, oh, they dance. It's almost over. Every dance that I went to, except for once I got into high school, like junior prom and senior prom, we dance our little asses off. We have fun. But like the earlier, like middle school and like ninth grade school dances, I guess it just took everybody a moment to get comfortable. And then finally the DJ would put on a song we knew and everyone's like, oh my gosh, I like this song. Let's go dance. And it would still be like the guys dancing near the guys and the girls dancing near the girls. But at some point they all just kind of just merge into one. For me, it was the opposite. I felt like the middle school dances were a lot dirtier <laughs> than the high school stuff. Like when I went to senior prom, I mean, maybe it's because it's a more formal setting. Like, yeah, there was dancing going on, but it, it was pretty appropriate. It, you know, like we, it, it just seemed like we were having a family friendly good time. But for some reason, uh, my middle school, I don't know if it was because it was Hartford area in Connecticut, but God, I mean, I can just remember that transition from like, oh, prim and proper eighth grade middle school graduation where we're all dressed up, you know, with our parents taking pictures. And then, oh, once the fucking parents leave you to the dance with your fellow friends, some you have crushes on, watch out. It was just, it was a sweaty, sexually hormone induced a good time. It was just, I, 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 I if I have kids someday, I, I, I cannot imagine them doing what I did at 12 or 13 in those dances. <laughs> See, that is just hilarious to me because like we didn't have like that until like prom. Like prom, you might as well just say we were at Freak Nick or we were at a club because people were just dancing on everybody. But then we had like, what was it, Lil John from the windows to the wall then and everything where it was like, oh, this music is so adult, but it was so much fun. But as kids, we did not have that. God, wow. Is it, it, were, did, was there some kind of religious background to your schooling or, or I mean where did you come from Texas and so Texas Hawaii I mean military schools is kind of what it was like the younger years yes but older I guess say yeah once we got into public school it was like okay this is a good dance like oh well, like we had the franchise boys playing at our prom and I think graduation so we had like some ratchet music but it wasn't until we were older yeah okay so I'm, I'm I'm guessing that because of the military schooling background like yeah because me I mean it, it was like a hard shift I I, I did I, I had a Christian school education back in my elementary years and then literally sixth grade my parents were like all right this Christian private school too expensive we're just gonna get you in the public school system and all of a sudden it was like wait what oh my god people are saying the f word and people are talking about going out with each other even though going out with each other means like holding hands and kissing after school or whatever because obviously we couldn't drive like it was such a big culture shift and change and shock and uh yeah i i out of god oh my god anyway laura says she's looking forward to when she's older and boys get braver and i was like ah oh, i got news for you boys just i mean there, there are boys that are fucking like 45 that are nervous as hell i mean it really there, there's never a point where you're like oh my god i'm gonna be brave and always be brave no there isn't unless you get a little liquor with courage behind you <laughs> Carl gets up from the couch and tells Laura if the boys get too brave that in a playful, manly voice, he says, you let me know. Oh, Carl. <laughs> that was the most least threatening thing ever, Carl. <laughs> and, and, and I felt like it was meant to be. I felt like he, he meant to be playful at that. We know that Carl is not going to be the intimidating dad. He's just too much of a charming goofball to be one. 
He really is. You just want to hug him. Laura laughs at her dad along with the audience and tells him okay. And Carl thankfully follows up by walking over to Laura and apologizing for setting her up with Steve tonight. Laura thanks dad for the apology and says that the next time he feels like setting her up, do her a favor and picture Steve Urkel. Carl looks at Harriet for a moment to think about the picture, and then they both physically cringe at the same time as the audience laughs at what technically is a really mean thing to say <laughs> about Steve. But, you know, 1989 sitcom, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things we all do it with our family or friends where we're like, yeah, just picture that if you ever want to do something for me. Steve Urkel with a yeast infection. Picture that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I've given you so many disturbing images to today. It's it's insane, right? You have. I'm not going to be able to eat for at least like an hour after this. <laughs> That's the healthy thing to do. Credits and music come up to end an episode that officially sets the tone for the show for the next nine seasons. The end. So I would say Steve would, did not appear as much as I thought he would, but he still made enough of a presence where you know, like, okay, the audience loves this character. Clearly, as Rich said in the interview, like, they picked up on the studio audience response, and even though I don't think... Does Steve appear in the next episode? Oh, I actually don't know. I have to watch it again. I don't yeah. remember. Yes, he does. I don't know if he's in the cold open. He might be, but I'm just channeling a line where someone's like, Steve, you never knock. So I feel like he's in the next episode. I'm very curious about that. Uh, speaking of which, our next episode, Man's Best Friend. Season one, episode 13, uh, the dog episode. Definitely have some thoughts on that. Another one directed by the amazing Rich Correll. Again, for you listening, please listen to our conversation with them. It is very lovely. And the original air date. I mean, the show clearly had a holiday break and... This episode, we officially enter the 1990s, January 5th, 1990 is the air date We're of this. Stepping into the new decade. Yes. You are what? Like about to be two? I soon? would be two at this point. Yeah. And well, one in what? Eight months? Eight yeah, months think- from there. So I'd be one in two months old. There you go. And it, 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 God, it's still almost another two years before I'm born. <laughs> <laughs> you don't miss out on anything. There's nothing happening in the 90s. All right. I mean, again, man, I mean, I think as we mentioned in our very first uh, episode when we recap the pilot, I think it's not until the third season of Family Matters that I'm born. Yeah, you got a little bit of time. You get to develop some more Urkel before you are touched by Urkel. Yep, 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 yep. Oh, touched by Urkel. What another disturbing image. I'm imagining the show touched by Angel, but Steve Urkel is the angel. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining. Like they partnered him with Della Reese and it would just be so good. God, don't even get me started on that. My mom loved that show. She was on that show every fucking Sunday night on CBS. Yeah, it was like Touched by an Angel, 60 Minutes. Like, oh my God, you're bringing back nostalgia right now. Oh, my mom, this was her TV block on Sundays. Chuck Norris. Then walk no, it was Walker Texas Ranger, which was Chuck Norris. Then Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, and then Touched by an Angel. And she'd be like, we have to sit down and watch Touched by an Angel so you guys all get a dose of Jesus today. <laughs> yeah. Naturally, you know, if you're these deeply religious, Christian devoted black women, you just find any source of media you can that reflects your beliefs. And for my mom, it was like the, the Christian radio station in town. It was touched by an angel. So, uh, you know, and and, and 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 fittingly enough, it was literally one of the most successful, highly rated shows for CBS. It did really, really well for a religious show. It did. It did really well. And I actually sometimes find myself going back and watching an episode here and there when it pops up on my fire stick and I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch a little touch by an angel just because it's a feel good show. Yeah. And the lead white lady in that uh, show, Roma Downey, it's kind of interesting to sometimes hear like, you know, about her. And, well, first of all, the fact that she is married to Mark Burnett, who is the producer behind reality shows like The Apprentice, like that, that was very interesting. But yeah, no, sometimes, you know, they, they get criticized for maybe like imposing their beliefs where it's not appropriate. So interesting to hear that and then have this nostalgic thing of like, oh, yeah, you're the lady that I grew up on, uh, on Touched by an Angel. Like, we're all over the place in this episode. I love it. So subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. Questions, comments, concerns, feedback can go to the delicious recap at gmail.com. You can follow us Facebook, Instagram, threads, TikTok, YouTube at Family Matters Rewatch Pod. Andrew, how can people follow you on socials? 
You can follow me as AJ Vandertunt only on Instagram and TikTok. I am not on any other platform. There is a Facebook page, but again, I do not check it. I don't open it. I don't like Facebook. So if you message me there, I'm not going to see it. I am sorry in advance, but just look for Vandertunt. If you type in my name, I will pop up. I'm the only one on Instagram and TikTok. Okay, sounds good. Just watch your Facebook following. Just increase, increase, increase <laughs> to the most popular thing ever. And, and you just keep saying, stop it. I'm not on there. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if I end up becoming like Facebook famous and people are like, you have a million followers, I still wouldn't even know. But I thank you guys for following it. Like literally advertising clients will come up to, oh, Andrew, we see you have a big following. Like, would you like to, you know, uh, sell soap ads on your Facebook page? No, I'm not on Facebook, even though like they offer you like a million dollars to sell Dove soap on Facebook. No, I might open up my Facebook page for that. For that. <laughs> if they're like, oh, you have to have Facebook for a million dollars. OK, I'll log right back in for you guys. Take us away, please. We've got this. This was a great episode, so I hope you all enjoyed it and let the deliciousness ring. Mm-hmm.